Wrapped in Underpants and the Wrath of the Wicked Wedgie Woman, the fifth epic novel by Dave Pilkey. Hi, everybody. Before you listen to this story, there's some stuff you need to know. This introduction will fill you in on the story so far. But remember, this info was top secret. So don't let it fall into the wrong hands. The Trouble with Captain Underpants. Now it can be told. A informational comic by George and Harold. Once upon a time, there were two cool kids named George and Harold. We kick butt. Me too. Come over here, bubs. No way. One time, George and Harold hypnotized Mr. Krupp with the 3D Hypno Ring, registered trademark. You will obey our command. Okay. George and Harold made him think he was a great superhero named Captain Underpants. Look, I'm Captain Underpants. <laughs> it was funny at first, but then Mr. Krupp jumped out the window. Hey, where do you think you're going? To fight crime, okay? George and Harold had to chase after him, so he wouldn't get killed and hurt. Come over here, bub. No way. They had many adventures with lots of inappropriate humor. Diapers and toilets and poop, oh my. Then one day, Mr. Krupp accidentally drank superpower juice. Now he got superpowers. He can fly, too. La -la -la. Two things you have to be careful about is water and finger snaps. For if you snap your fingers by Mr. Krupp, he turns into Captain Underpants. La -la -la. And if you pour water on Captain Underpants' head, he turns back into Mr. Krupp. Blah, blah, blah. So, if you see Mr. Krupp, don't snap your fingers, or you'll be sorry. And if you see Captain Underpants, don't pour no water on his head, or you'll be sorrier. Remember, this is top secret, so don't tell anybody. Treehouse Comics, Inc. Chapter 1, George and Harold. This is George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. We rule! Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Me too! Remember that now. Hey, George, this book is about us! Um, Harold, can you stop interrupting the narrator? I'm trying to listen. Sorry. At most schools, the teachers try to emphasize the three R's. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. But George and Harold's teacher, Miserable, was more concerned with enforcing what she called the three S's. Sit down, shut your pie holes, and stop driving me crazy! While this was unfortunate for all of her students, it was especially bad for George and Harold because they were very imaginative boys. You see, imagination was not really encouraged at George and Harold's school, in fact, it was discouraged. Imagination would only get you a one-way ticket to the principal's office. This was sad for George and Harold because they didn't get straight A's, they weren't sports stars, and they could barely walk down the hallway without getting into trouble. Yeah, like the time we changed the letters around on the sign outside the gym. You mean the one that said, people, please wear your socks on the gym floor? <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> we changed it to say, please go peep beyond your socks for warmth. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, was awesome. awesome. See what I mean? But George and Harold had one thing that most of the other folks at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School didn't have. Imagination. They were full of it. And one day, they would use that imagination to save the entire human race from being overthrown by a crazed woman with even crazier superpowers. But before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this story. Chapter 2. Miserable's Big News One fine day, George and Harold's homeroom teacher, Ms. Ribble, entered the classroom looking a bit meaner than usual. All right, settle down, shouted Miserable. I have some bad news. I'm retiring. 
cried the children. Not today, snapped Miserable. At the end of the school year. Oh, man, moaned the children. But the staff is throwing a retirement party for me today, said Miserable. Hooray! Cried the children. During recess, said Miserable. Oh, man, moaned the children. There will be lots of free ice cream, said Miserable. Hooray! Cried the children. My favorite flavor, chunky tofu, said Miserable. Moaned the children. But first, said Miserable, it's time for something fun! Hooray! Cried the children. You all get to make happy retirement cards for me, said Miserable. Oh, man! Moaned the children. Chapter 3 When You Care Enough to Send the Very Best. Miserable went around the classroom handing out envelopes, sheets of construction paper, and butterfly stencils to all of the children. Then she wrote a poem on the chalkboard. All right, take out your crayons, said Miserable harshly. I want you to use stencils to make a yellow butterfly on the front of your cards. When you're done, copy this poem on the inside. Roses are red, violets are blue. You are retiring, and we'll miss you. Signed, your name here. Uh, can we make up our own poems? Asked Melvin Sneedly. No! Snapped Miserable. Do we have to use stencils? Asked Aaron Mancini. Yes! Yelled Miserable. Can we make our butterflies purple? Asked Stephanie Yarkov. No! Screamed Miserable. Butterflies are yellow! Everyone knows that! While the rest of the class worked on their cards, George and Harold had a better idea. Let's make Miserable a comic book instead, said George. Yeah, said Harold. We can make it all about her. It'll be cool. So that's just what they did. Chapter 4 Captain Underpants and the Wrath of the Wicked Wedgie Woman Captain Underpants and the Wrath of the Wicked Wedgie Woman Story by George Beard Pictures by Harold Hutchins Once upon a time, there was a really mean teacher named Ms. Ripple, who was very mean. I am evil! She gave us lots of homework and yelled at us all the time. Read 250 pages for a test! Oh, man! One time at Christmas vacation, she gave everybody 41 book reports. Ho, ho, ho! Wake up! It's Christmas morning! Time to open your presents! I can't! I have to do my homework! After Christmas, everybody turned in a big pile of book reports. Ho, ho, ho! Then, something terrible happened. Miss Ribble was buried in a mountain of book reports. She's really most sincerely dead. No, she's not. I'm a doctor. We can rebuild her. We can make her better than she was. Faster, stronger, eviler. When Miss Ribble got out of the hospital, she had bionic powers. I will take over the world! Ha ha ha! So she made an evil costume. Her bionic beehive hairdo opened up to reveal an evil Wedgie Robo Claw. She used it to give wedgies to innocent bystanders. <laughs> Nobody can stop me now! Ouchies! Help! Wedgie Woman is in the teacher's lounge. She just drank all the coffee, and now she's giving the gym teacher a killer wedgie. Oh, the horror! She better make a fresh pot. This looks like a job for... <laughs> What's the problem, bub? Help, it's Wedgie Woman! So Captain Underpants got into a big fight with Wedgie Woman. <laughs> she tried to give him a wedgie, but... Captain Underpants was faster than a speeding waistband. More 
more powerful than boxer shorts. Ow! Ouch! And able to leap tall buildings without getting a wedgie. Fra la la! Rats! So Wedgie Woman went to the store to buy some spray starch. Ooh! What do we have here? New spray starch! Warning! Do not spray this product on your underwear or you'll be sorry! Aha! Starch is the enemy of underwear! Wedgie Woman sprayed. Gotcha! Hey! Oh no! My underpants is all stiff and uncomfortable! Ha ha! Captain Underpants tried to push the buttons on his utility waistband, but they were broke. He was powerless! I'm doomed! Wedgie Woman gave Captain Underpants a big wedgie! Ouchies! Then she hung him from a pole. Rats! Nobody can stop me now! Soon, some kids came by. Captain Underpants needs our help! So they threw him a rope. Catch! <laughs> then they pulled real hard and let go. <laughs> Captain Underpants flew through the air and landed in a swimming pool. Ah, convenient swimming pool! The kids poured fabric softener in the pool. Suddenly, the starch got washed away. Hooray! <laughs> My underpants is soft and cottony once again. Hallelujah! Thanks, kids. No, no problemo. Problem Soon, Captain Underpants found Wedgie Woman. Remember me? Get him, Roboclaw! It's Wedgie time! He flew up and looped around. The Robo Claw reached for underwear, but it grabbed the wrong pair. Owie, wowie! It's off to jail with you. Oh man! Fra la la! The end. Notice any similarities to actual persons, living or dead, is very, very unfortunate. Treehouse Comics Inc. Chapter 5, The Wrath of Miserable When Miserable read the comic book that George and Harold had made, she was furious. Boys! she yelled. You've just earned yourselves a one-way ticket to the principal's office! But all we did was use our imaginations, said George. You're not allowed to do that in this school, snapped Miserable. Weren't you paying attention back in Chapter 1? George and Harold gathered their things, and soon they were sitting in the office outside Mr. Krupp's door. Mr. Krupp is on the phone, said the school secretary, Miss Anthrope. Why don't you boys make yourselves useful and copy the Friday memo for me? You can pass them out to all the classrooms for me while I go to lunch. Oh, man, said George. Quit your whining, buster! shouted Miss Anthrope. I want this done by the time I get back, or you'll both be sorry. Miss Anthrope grabbed her coat and stomped out the door. George and Harold looked at the Friday memo. It was a weekly newsletter that told all about the events of the upcoming week. Jerome Horowitz Elementary School. Friday memo. Next week's news. Monday. Band practice canceled. No practice today due to asbestos removal in the gymnasium. Tuesday, School Spirit Day. Show your school spirit by wearing the school colors, gray and dark gray. Wednesday, cheerleader tryouts today. Anyone wishing to join the cheerleading squad must do all of the following. One, meet in the gym after school. Two, have the school cheer memorized. Three. Don't forget to wear gym shoes. Thursday. Football practice rescheduled. All football players report to soccer field for early practice. Today only. Pep rally at 3.15 in the gym. 
Friday. Yearbook photos taken today. Please dress appropriately. Anyone caught making funny faces will receive a detention. Hey, said George. Miss Anthrope's computer is still on. You want to make a few changes to this newsletter? Why not, said Harold. So George and Harold typed up their own version of the Jerome Horwitz Elementary School Friday Memo. Friday Memo. Next week's news. Monday. School canceled. No classes today due to lack of interest. Tuesday. National Wear Your Pajamas to School and Pick Your Nose Day. Show you care by wearing your pajamas to school and picking your nose. Wednesday. Cheerleader tryouts today. Anyone wishing to join the cheerleading squad must do all of the following. 1. Eat 10 whole cloves of raw garlic. 2. Draw a mustache on your face with permanent markers. 3. Tape a three-day-old egg salad sandwich to your head. Thursday. Football practice rescheduled. All football players report to teacher's lounge for early practice. Food fight at 12.15 in the lunchroom. Friday. Yearbook photos taken today. Please wear bumblebee costumes. Also, whoever makes the funniest face wins a free pizza party for their class. Then they ran off copies for all the students in the school. Chapter 6. The Retirement Card George and Harold were gathering their new and improved Friday Memo copies into small piles when Principal Krupp came into the office. Hey, Mr. Krupp shouted. What are you two troublemakers doing in here? Miss Anthrope told us to pass the Friday Memo out to all the classrooms said George innocently. Well, make it snappy, yelled Principal Krupp. Suddenly, Harold got a sneaky idea. He took out the blank piece of construction paper that Miserable had given him earlier. Hey, Mr. Krupp, said Harold, will you sign this retirement card for our teacher? Mr. Krupp grabbed the card from Harold and eyed it suspiciously. This card is blank, Mr. Krupp growled. I know, said Harold. Our class is going to decorate it later. We wanted you to be the first to sign it. Well, all right then, said Mr. Krupp. He opened the card and quickly scribbled, Signed, Mr. Krupp, on the inside. Then he stormed out of the office. What are you going to do with that? asked George. You'll see, said Harold, smiling. Chapter 7. Reverse Psychology George and Harold passed out the Friday memo and made it back to their classroom just in time for Miserable's retirement party. George quickly changed the letters around on the sign outside the door, from Have a blissfully grand retirement, Ms. Ribble, to Ms. Ribble really needs a breath mint, while Harold wrote a special greeting on Mr. Krupp's card and stuffed it into the envelope. Hey, bubs, shouted Mr. Krupp as he stormed down the hall. What do you kids think you're doing? We're going to Miserable's retirement party, said George. That's what you think, smart guy, said Mr. Krupp. Ms. Ribble showed me that comic book you boys made about her. And now I catch you changing the letters around on another sign. You boys aren't going to any party. You're going straight to the detention room. Well, fine, said Harold. Then we're not going to give Miserable the card our class made for her. Mr. Krupp quickly swiped the card out of Harold's hand. Swipe! Aha! He shouted. I'm going to make sure she gets this card. I'm going to give it to her myself. Oh, man, said Harold. George and Harold walked down the hallway toward the detention room. Wow! said George. That was pretty cool how you got Mr. Krupp to deliver that phony card for you. Yep, said Harold. I used reverse psychology on him. I've got to try that sometime, said George. By the way, what did you write on that card? 
You'll see, said Harold, smiling. Chapter 8 The Party Miserable's retirement party started off bad and just got worse. First, Miserable forced the class to sing a corny song to her. We love Miserable, written and arranged by Tara Ribble. We, we love Miss Ribble, oh yes we do. We don't love anyone as much as you. When you retire, we'll be blue. Oh, Miss Ribble, we love you. <laughs> by the time she was done yelling at the boys for singing off key, the chunky tofu ice cream was melted. Everybody had to eat it anyway. Then the children handed in their happy retirement cards. Miserable ripped several of the cards up because some of the children had mistakenly drawn polka dots on their butterflies. One unfortunate boy had also drawn a happy, smiling sunshine on his card, and he had to stand in the corner. Finally, Mr. Krupp stepped forward and handed Miserable the card he had snatched from Harold's hand. I went to a lot of trouble to get this for you. Mr. Krupp said gallantly. Miserable tore the envelope open and read the card out loud. You're one hot mama, said Miserable, with a shocked look on her face. Ew, cried the children. She opened the card and read the inside. Will you marry me? Signed Mr. Krupp? Ew, cried the children. The teachers gasped. Then the room grew silent. Miserable glared over at Mr. Krupp, who had turned bright red and began sweating profusely. He tried to speak. He tried to tell her it was all a big mistake. He tried to say something. But all that came out was um. Congratulations, said Mr. Meaner, as he patted Mr. Krupp's sweaty, shivering shoulder. Yes! Congratulations, shouted Miss Anthrope. This will be the best wedding in the whole world. We can have it here at the school, a week from Saturday. I'll plan everything. You lovebirds don't have to worry about a thing. Uh, uh, great. Thanks, said Miserable still looking quite angry and confused. b b b b b hub 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 wa wa said Mr. Krupp. Chapter 9. Freaky Weaky The following week at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School was definitely one of the weirdest ones they'd had in a while. For example, none of the kids showed up for school on Monday, but Mr. Krupp didn't even seem to notice. Hey, where is everybody today? asked Mr. Rected. Bub-bub-bub-bub-hub-hub-hub-a-wa-wa? said Mr. Krupp. On Tuesday, everybody did show up in their pajamas. Why is everybody picking their noses? asked Miss Fit. Bub-bub-bub-bub-hub-hub-hub-a-wa-wa? said Mr. Krupp. On Wednesday, for some strange reason, the whole school smelled like garlic and rotten egg salad sandwiches, especially some of the girls. Boy, said Miss Guided, the styles today sure are getting bizarre. Bubba 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 hubba 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 wawa, said Mr. Krupp. Thursday was, without a doubt, a complete and total disaster. <laughs> There's a food fight in the lunchroom! shouted Mr. Usworthy. And the football team is destroying the teacher's lounge! Bubba 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 hubba 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 wawa, said Mr. Krupp. Now, nobody was sure what happened on Friday. Apparently, there was a mix-up with the dress code and the yearbook photos. Our school pictures are ruined, shouted Miss Dakin. Bubba 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 hubba hubba wawa, said Mr. Krupp. Yes, it was a freaky week, all right. But the big wedding was only a day away, and things were about to get really freaky. Chapter 10 The Big Wedding It was Saturday 
the day of the big wedding. Miss Anthrope, true to her word, had taken care of everything. In just one week, she had transformed the gymnasium into a beautiful wedding hall, complete with food, decorations, and even a six-foot-tall ice sculpture. All of the children were dressed in their finest clothes. Harold even wore a tie. Man, said George, I can't believe we have to go to school on Saturday. I know, said Harold. Why couldn't they have had this wedding during Monday's math test? Soon, the organist began to play. The rabbi walked down the aisle. He approached George and Harold and stopped to talk to the two boys. I've heard a lot about you two, said the rabbi, and I don't want you boys playing any of your tricks today. Silly rabbi, said George. Tricks are for kids. Believe it or not, George and Harold had not planned any pranks for the big wedding. They had no joy buzzers up their sleeves, no squirting flowers in their lapels, and no whoopee cushions on their chairs. They were on their best behavior. Nothing could go wrong today. In no time at all, Miserable and Mr. Krupp were standing in front of the rabbi, looking quite ill. The rabbi asked Mr. Krupp if he would take Miserable to be his lawfully wedded wife. Bubba 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 hub hubba wawa, said Mr. Krupp. Then the rabbi asked Miserable if she would take Mr. Krupp to be her husband. There was a long silence. Everyone leaned forward. Miserable looked nervously from side to side. Suddenly, she shouted out at the top of her lungs, No! Miserable turned to Mr. Krupp and jabbed her finger into his shoulder. Listen, Krupp, she said. I can't marry you. Hooray! Uh, I mean, oh, that's too bad, said Mr. Krupp. You're a mean, cruel, and vicious man, said Miserable, and I respect that. It's just... it's just... Just what? asked Mr. Krupp. It's just your nose, said Miserable. You've got the most ridiculous nose. I've never seen anything quite like it. I just couldn't marry somebody with such a silly nose. Mr. Krupp got angry. Well, fine he shouted. I didn't want to marry you anyway. It was all George and Harold's fault. They tricked us. Suddenly, everybody in the gymnasium turned and looked at George and Harold. Time to go, said George. Chapter 11. The Refreshments. As George and Harold turned to leave the gymnasium, they heard the loud thumps of cleated wedding boots clomping down the aisle toward them. I'm gonna grind those kids into head cheese! Screamed Miserable as she lunged for the two boys. George and Harold screamed and ran to the back of the room near the refreshments. There they hid behind two large wooden pillars. Miserable approached the pillars and grasped them with her mighty hands. With a horrible roar, she pushed the right pillar over and landed on the back of the luncheon table, causing the front of the table to flip high into the air. Unfortunately, this sent all of the food flying into the crowd. The creamy candied carrots clobbered the kindergartners. The fatty fried fish fritters flipped onto the first graders. The sweet and sour spaghetti squash splattered the second graders. 3,000 thawing thimbleberries thudded the third graders. 500 frosted fudgy fruitcakes flogged the fourth graders. And 55 fistfuls of fancy french fried frankfurters flattened the fifth graders. By now, you're probably worried that the wedding guests had nothing to drink with their lovely appetizers. Well, rest assured, the second pillar took care of that. Miserable pushed the left pillar into the fresh fruit display, causing it to topple over 
sending two large watermelons crashing down into two oversized punch bowls. This created two enormous splashes of tropical fruit-flavored punch, which rained down upon the wedding guests like a torrential downpour. Now, no wedding is complete without a wedding cake. And when Ms. Ribble kicked the ice sculpture over, the resulting crash sent the beautiful double-deckered cake flipping high into the air, right over Miserable's head. I've got you now! screamed Miserable, as she grabbed George and Harold by their neckties. George and Harold undid their ties and ran out of the gymnasium screaming as the wedding cake came down on Miserable's head with a tremendous splat. Man, cried Harold, I thought we were dead meat. That's what we get for going to school on Saturday, said George. Chapter 12, Ribble's Revenge. As you might imagine, George and Harold were nervous about going back to class on Monday. But for some strange reason, Miserable seemed happy to see them. Good morning, boys! Miserable chirped with a giant, evil, toothy grin. Come here. I've got something to show you. Uh-oh, said George. She's smiling. That can't be a good sign. George and Harold cautiously approached Ms. Ribble's desk. I took the liberty of adjusting your grades last weekend, said Ms. Ribble. You'll be happy to know that all your grades have just dropped from B's and C's to F's and G's. Oh, no, George gasped. Not F's and G's. Hey. What's a G? It's the only grade lower than an F, said Miserable. There's no such grade as a G, said Harold. There is now, bub, said Miserable. Looks like you're both going to flunk the fourth grade. Won't that be fun? No way, said George. That's not fair. Life ain't fair, said Miserable. Get used to it. Chapter 13. A Bad Idea That afternoon, George and Harold sat in their treehouse feeling sorry for themselves. She can't get away with that, said George. We've got to tell somebody about this. Nobody's going to believe us, said Harold. Well, there is one thing we can do, said George. He opened the drawer to their drawing table and searched through the pennies, paper clips, dried spitballs, and rubber bands. Then he pulled out a dusty plastic ring with some gum stuck on it. It was the 3D Hypno Ring. Oh, no, said Harold. I thought we threw that thing away. We just threw the instructions away, said George, but I remember how it works. Do you remember what happened the last time we used it? asked Harold. Yeah, said George. But we were fooling around last time. This time we'll be serious. We won't make any mistakes. All we have to do is hypnotize her into changing our grades back to normal. That's all. I don't know, said Harold. It sounds like a bad idea to me. Worse than flunking the fourth grade? asked George. Good point, said Harold. Chapter 14 The Return of the 3D Hypno Ring The next day at school, George and Harold stayed behind while the rest of the class went outside for recess. What are you punks still doing here? asked Ms. Ribble. Um, said George nervously. Uh, we wanted to show you this really cool ring. Yeah, said Harold. If you look closely at it, you can see a funny picture. Well, hold it still, said Miserable as she stared at the ring intently. I have to move it back and forth, said George, or you won't be able to see the picture. Ms. Ribble's eyes followed the ring back and forth, back and forth. Back and forth, back and forth. 
You are getting sleepy, said George. Very sleepy, said Harold. Miserable yawned. Her eyes began to droop. I'm so sleepy, she said as she slowly closed her eyes. In a moment, said George, I will snap my fingers. Then you will be hypnotized. So sleepy, mumbled miserable. Snap. Now, said Harold, you must listen very... Chapter 14 and a half. We interrupt this chapter to bring you this important message. Hello, this is Chim Chim Diaper Brains. Er, I mean, this is Ingrid Ashley, reporting for Eyewitness News. We have a late-breaking story about a tragic incident that is now occurring in the Pacific Northwest. Police have just closed down the Lil Wise Guy Novelty Company in Walla Walla, Washington. Apparently, this company has been selling very dangerous hypno rings. We now take you live via satellite to our reporter Booger Stinker Squirt, or I mean Larry Zaro, with the latest developments. Thanks, Chim Chim, said Larry. Reports have poured in from all across the country concerning children who have used the 3D hypno ring on their friends and family with disastrous results. But the most shocking revelation is the effect that the rings seem to have on women. Apparently, whenever the ring is used to hypnotize a woman, a mental blunder occurs causing the woman to do the opposite of what she is being hypnotized to do. Doctors don't know why the ring causes women to have an opposite reaction, but they are very concerned. If you or someone you love has purchased a 3D hypno ring, throw it away at once. And whatever you do, please don't use it on a woman. Chapter 14 and 3 quarters. We now return to our regularly scheduled chapter, already in progress. And when we snap our fingers, George continued, you will change our grades back to normal. Yeah, said Harold, and you won't do anything crazy, like turn into Wedgie Woman. And you won't try to destroy Captain Underpants, said George, or take over the world either. Right, said Harold. You'll just change our grades, and that's it. George and Harold looked nervously at each other. Well, said George, I think that covers everything. Yep, said Harold. We shouldn't have any more problems from Miserable. So the boys snapped their fingers. Snap! Chapter 15 Bad Hair Night That night, Harold and George camped out in George's treehouse. I have to drive your mother to work early tomorrow morning, said George's dad, so you boys are responsible for getting yourselves to school on time. Okay, Pop, said George. We'll be there bright and early, Mr. Beard, said Harold. It had been a tough day for George and Harold, and now it was time to relax. George rolled out the sleeping bags while Harold unpacked a box of chocolate donuts, four cans of orange cream soda, and a big bowl of barbecue potato chips. Believe it or not, there was even a cool Japanese monster movie playing on TV. You know, said George, life doesn't get any better than this. Yep, said Harold. But do you think the hypno ring actually worked on Miserable? She looked a little weird when she came out of her trance. Ah, uh, she was probably just sleepy, said George. Teachers have very stressful jobs, you know. I wonder why, said Harold. After the movie... George and Harold brushed the crumbs out of their sleeping bags and got ready for bed. Let's sleep in our school clothes tonight, said George. 
That way we won't have to wake up early to get dressed. Good idea, said Harold. So George turned out the light, and soon the two boys were drifting off to sleep. After a few minutes, Harold sat up quickly and looked around. Hey, he whispered, what's that noise? I didn't hear anything, said George. They listened closely. Shh, said Harold. There it is again. George heard it this time. He reached over and opened the treehouse door a crack. All they could hear was the sound of crickets chirping in the night. George opened the door wider, and the boys peeked down. <coughs> Roared an evil-looking woman dressed in tight purple vinyl and a mangy-looking fake fur boa. George and Harold screamed in horror. The snarling woman climbed from the ladder into the treehouse. George and Harold recognized her immediately in the moonlight. Miserable, George gasped. What a lovely, uh, outfit you have on. Who's miserable? The angry lady growled. My name is Wedgie Woman. George and Harold looked at each other and swallowed hard. I understand that you boys have information about Captain Underpants, said Wedgie Woman. What makes you say that? asked Harold. I've read your comic books, said the evil villain. You boys know his strengths, his weaknesses, and I'll bet you even know his secret identity. No way, said George. Captain Underpants isn't real. He, he's just a cartoon. We'll see about that, Wedgie Woman scoffed. Wedgie Woman reached out and grasped George's and Harold's arms. What do we do now, cried Harold. We can take her, said George. It's not like she has superpowers or anything. Chapter 16 Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Beehive? The struggle that followed may someday be remembered as the single most unlucky thing that ever happened in the history of the world. First, George pulled his arm out of Wedgie Woman's grasp. Then, Harold squirmed away too. When Wedgie Woman lunged after them, George crouched down into a ball behind Wedgie Woman's feet. All it took was a simple nudge from Harold to send the ferocious female toppling over backward, right into the wall. Clunk! The bookshelf above Wedgie Woman's head shook violently, causing a strange-looking juice carton to topple over. Suddenly, a stream of glowing green juice poured out of the carton, directly into the tightly woven beehive of hair atop Wedgie Woman's head. No! yelled Harold as he grabbed the juice carton. This is the juice we got from that spaceship back in our third book. You mean the one with the annoyingly long title? asked George. Yeah, said Harold. This is extra strength superpower juice, and a whole bunch of it got in her hair. Don't worry, said George. None of it got in her mouth. What's the worst thing that could happen? Her hairstyle would have superpowers? Well, said Harold, I guess you're right. That is pretty stupid even for one of our stories. It's pretty funny, though, said George. Suddenly, two coiled arms of twisting hair shot out of Wedgie Woman's head and grabbed George and Harold by the back of their underwear, yanking them high into the air. You know, said George, this isn't as funny as I thought it would be. Chapter 17, All Tied Up. Wedgie Woman brought George and Harold back to her house and tied the boys tightly to two chairs. Tell me the secret identity of Captain Underpants, screamed Wedgie Woman. No way, said George. Hmm, said Wedgie Woman. You want to do this the hard way? No problem. Wedgie Woman's hair began uncoiling itself. Several twisted locks of hair stretched out into the living room and started taking apart the television, the computer, and a thigh master, registered trademark. 
Other tangled coils reached into the kitchen and began dismantling the dishwasher, the toaster oven, and a Ronco, trademark, food dehydrator. What are you doing? asked Harold. If you want to make robots, said Wedgie Woman, you gotta break a few small appliances. George and Harold watched impatiently while Wedgie Woman's hair assembled thousands of assorted screws, bolts, wires, ears, cathode tubes, and computer chips. Soon, two small robots began taking shape. I didn't know Miserable was smart enough to make robots, said Harold. Me neither, said George. I think some of that extra strength superpower juice must have soaked into her brain. The next morning, Wedgie Woman completed her robots, which she named Robo George and the Harold 2000. You know, said Harold, something about those robots seems a little familiar. Yeah, said George. They kind of look like us, only not as dashingly handsome. Wedgie Woman opened the robot's chest plates and inserted a can of spray starch into each one. Then she sealed the chest plates, patted each robot on the head, and sent them both off to school. <laughs> Captain Underpants doesn't stand a chance now! Wedgie Woman laughed. Wait a minute, said Harold. How are those two robots going to stop Captain Underpants? All they have to do is wait and listen, said Wedgie Woman. And as soon as they hear the words tra la la, it'll all be over. Chapter 18 Robo George and the Harold 2000. Uh, attention, boys and girls, said Mr. Krupp to the fourth graders. Your teacher, Miserable, didn't come to school today. Shouted the children. Settle down! Mr. Krupp shouted. You're still going to have all your classes! Oh, man! Moaned the children. But you're going to have a substitute teacher, said Mr. Krupp. Hooray! Shouted the children. And it's going to be me, said Mr. Krupp. Oh, man! Moaned the children. The whole day was pretty much like a normal day, except for one thing. Mr. Krupp couldn't understand why George and Harold were so well behaved. They didn't make funny noises during science class. They didn't stick crayons up their noses during art class. And they didn't draw comic books during math class. In fact, they even walked past a sign without changing the letters around. Mr. Krupp was stunned. All right, you two, Mr. Krupp shouted. I know you're up to something. You better stop being so good or you're going to be in big trouble. But Robo George and the Harold 2000 kept right on behaving. The only time they did something even remotely wrong was during recess. Everybody was playing kickball, and when it was the Harold 2000's turn to kick the ball, he kicked it pretty darn hard. Boing! The kickball tore right through the top of page 101 and out the other side as it sailed toward the outer regions of Earth's atmosphere. Soon, it broke free of our planet's gravitational pull and began heading straight toward the planet Uranus. Aha! shouted Mr. Krupp as he pulled out the official school rulebook and read rule number 411 out loud. It is against the rules to kick school property into outer space. You're in trouble now, bub! But the Herald 2000 ignored Mr. Krupp and began running around the bases. Hey, I'm talking to you, Hutchins, Mr. Krupp shouted. He pointed at the Herald 2000 and snapped his fingers. Snap! Suddenly, Mr. Krupp began to change. A silly-looking smile stretched across his face, and he stood before the fourth graders looking quite heroic. Quickly, he turned and ran back into the school. Chapter 19 tra la lunatics Several minutes later, Captain Underpants flew out of Mr. Krupp's office window. 
As the heroes zipped across the sky, he let out a triumphant tra la la When Robo George and the Herald 2000 heard the words tra la la they immediately stopped playing kickball. Suddenly, their arms began to extend and their legs stretched toward the sky. Strange secret compartments in their ever-growing torsos opened up, revealing giant rocket boosters and the latest in advanced aviation technology. Steel panels on their faces and bodies expanded wildly as their complex structures swelled to highly improbable proportions. Suddenly, flames shot out of their retro thrusters as their bodies rose into the air. In no time at all, two gigantic robots were flying in hot pursuit of the amazing Captain Underpants. George and Harold are in big trouble now, said Melvin Sneedley, as he read rule number 7734 of Mr. Krupp's official school rulebook out loud. It is against the rules for students to transform into giant flying robots during afternoon recess. The real George and Harold, however, had more on their minds at that moment than a few broken rules. They watched the action unfold on a big screen television that Wedgie Woman's horrible hair had built by combining the spare parts of a fish tank and an electric toothbrush. The colossal robots surrounded Captain Underpants, but surprisingly, the waistband warrior looked happy to see them. George! Harold! said Captain Underpants. My, how you boys have grown! And I didn't know you could fly. That's great! Now you can help me fight for truth, justice, and all that is pre-shrunk and cottony. But the gigantic robots didn't respond. Instead, they hovered close to Captain Underpants as their steel chest plates opened up. Suddenly, two extendable robotic arms reached out and began showering Captain Underpants with liquid spray starch. What, what are you doing? cried Captain Underpants. That's spray starch. It's the only thing in the world that can take away my superpowers. <laughs> The waistband warrior screamed in horror as he began falling through the sky. Robo George quickly swooped down, grabbed the helpless hero, and hung him by his waistband on a tall pole high above the city streets. Chapter 20 You Axed For It! Hooray! cried Wedgie Woman as she turned off her new TV. My plan worked! Now it's time to take over the world. But what about us? asked Harold. Don't worry, said Wedgie Woman. I've got a big surprise for you two. She took a heavy battle axe and tied it up with a rope. Then she leaned the axe toward George and Harold and lit a candle under the rope. When the flame burns through the rope, said Wedgie Woman, problems will be over. Get the point? Not really, said George. Ha 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 ha! Don't worry, laughed Wedgie Woman. You will soon enough. <laughs> Wedgie Woman laughed a horrible laugh. Then she dashed out the door to take on the world. George and Harold watched as the flame began burning through the rope. They cringed as the impending doom of the axe blade came closer and closer. Well, said George, it looks like this is the end. Maybe not, said Harold. Maybe the blade will fall and slice through our ropes and not harm us at all. I doubt it, said George. That kind of thing only happens in really lame adventure stories. Suddenly, the blade fell and sliced through the ropes. Fuck, not harming George or Harold at all. The two boys looked at each other and decided it was best not to comment on the situation. Chapter 21 The Ruthless Revenge of the Wicked Wedgie Woman Wedgie Woman headed to the center of town to meet up with Robo George and the Harold 2000. Well done, my precious robots, said Wedgie Woman affectionately. Uh, what's all this, then? 
said a policeman who had just arrived on the scene. Uh, nothing, officer, said Wedgie Woman. Just the beginning of my total world domination. Oh, okay, said the cop. Hey, wait a minute. But before the police officer could voice his objections, a twisted dreadlock from Wedgie Woman's head shot out and grabbed the cop by the back of his underwear. The colossal Harold 2000 lifted the officer and hung him from a stop sign. Owie, wowie, cried the cop. Soon, more police officers headed to the scene, but they all met with the same terrible fate as the first policeman. Before long, every cop in the city was hanging from a street sign. Call the National Guard, screamed the chief of police. Call the Army! Call the Marines! Call a hairstylist! Soon, the armed forces arrived with a whole fleet of tanks and helicopters, but everybody was afraid to shoot. Wedgie Woman was just too quick. The giant robot stomped around the city as Wedgie Woman barked out her commands. Everybody on Earth must obey me, cried the wicked Wedgie Woman. If anybody refuses, they'll get the wedge. If anybody tries to stop me, it's Wedgie time. Bow down to me, or welcome to Wedgieville. Soon George and Harold arrived at the scene. They hid in some bushes and watched the terror unfold. We've got to rescue Captain Underpants, whispered George. He's the only one who can save the world. But how, whispered Harold. He's got no superpowers left. Sure he does, said George. Starch doesn't really take away superpowers. He just thinks it does. We've got to change his mind. I sure hope we can, said Harold. Chapter 22 They Can't George and Harold ran to the pole where the heartbroken hero was hanging. Hey, Captain Underpants, cried Harold. You've got to come down from there and save the city. C can't whined the waistband warrior. Need fabric softener? No, you don't need fabric softener, said George sternly. That was just a dumb joke in one of our comics. But you don't understand, said Captain Underpants. Starch is the enemy of underwear. Only fabric softener can save me. Rats, said Harold in frustration. Hey, George, are there any stores around here? Yeah, said George. A new one just opened down on Oak Street. Then let's go buy some fabric softener, said Harold. It'll be easier than trying to reason with the guy. How's that going to help? asked George. It's all in his mind, Harold explained. If he believes that fabric softener will save him, then it probably will. I think it's called the placenta effect. So George and Harold ran to Oak Street. What's the name of that store? asked Harold. I can't remember, said George. I think it's called everything except, um... Welcome to everything except fabric softener. The store for all your non-fabric softening needs. Oh, man, said George. We're doomed, cried Harold. Listen, said George, we've got to make another comic book. Now? asked Harold. It's our only hope, said George. The fate of the entire planet is in our hands. So the two boys bought some paper and a few pencils and got down to work. Twenty-two minutes later, George and Harold had created an all-new Captain Underpants adventure. They ran back to the pole where Captain Underpants was hanging and tossed their new comic up to him. This is no time to be reading comics, said Captain Underpants. Just read it, bub, said Harold. Yeah, said George. You might learn something. Chapter 23 The Origin of Captain Underpants The Origin of 
Captain Underpants, the true untold story by George Beard and Harold Hutchins. A far time ago, in a galaxy long, long away, there was a planet called Underpanty World. Underpanty World was a peaceful planet where everybody wore only underwear. Ha <laughs> ha! I can see your underwear. I can see yours, too. <laughs> hey, what are you doing under there? Underwear? <laughs> you just said underwear. <laughs> Everybody liked wearing underwear so much that they never got into fights. And they didn't have no wars, either. It was cool. But one day, all of that happiness ended abruptly. Wedgie Warlords had arrived in their starship Enterprise. Uh, hey, boss! Let's spray that planet with starch! Okay, I hate those guys! The good people of Underpanty World got scared, so they ran to their leader, Big Daddy Long Johns. Help us, Big, Big Daddy, Daddy Long Johns! Okay. Don't worry, I have a magic amulet that will protect us from starch. Yippee! But he accidentally dropped the magic amulet. Oopsies. It fell into the mouth of his newborn son, little baby underpants. Gulp. Oh no, he swallowed it. We are doomed. Just then, the wedgie warlord sprayed starch on underpanty world. Big Daddy Long Johns and his lovely wife, Princess Pantyhose, knew that their planet was a goner. So they decided to save their baby. Burp. So they stretched his underwear real far. Then they let go and shot him into space. Whee! Be good. Don't pick your nose. Little Baby Underpants sailed through space as his home planet crumbled behind him. Oh, man. Soon, Little Baby Underpants fell to Earth. Little Baby got adopted by some old guys. My, he's so cute. Let's adopt him. Okay. They named him Captain after their favorite cereal, Captain Crunchies. Hi, Captain. Hi. But as the years went by, Captain became very sad. For some strange reason, he never, ever seemed to fit in. Why do I feel so different? Maybe because he never wears anything but underwear. Then one night, he had a weird dream. He saw his old planet and his other parents. Hi, son. How's it going? Son, you aren't like other people. You are a superhero guy. Also, you have a magical amulet inside you. It will protect you from the evils of starch. All you have to do is say these words. I summon the power of Underpanty World. And you will overcome the powers of starch. Okay. So Captain Underpants awoke up and became a cool superhero guy. And he never had to be as scared of starch no more, even if Wedgie Woman's robot sprayed him with it. Because all he had to do was say, I summon the power of Underpanty World. And he would be free. Well, what are you waiting for? Just, Just say, say the, the words. words! Treehouse Comics, Inc. Chapter 24 the placenta effect. Well, said Captain Underpants, I didn't realize that I had the power within me all along to overcome the evils of starch. Just say the words, shouted George and Harold. Okay, said Captain Underpants, but I think it's a great metaphor for just say the words, yelled George and Harold. All right, said Captain Underpants, but all I'm saying is that... Just say the words! screamed George and Harold. You know, 
said Captain Underpants. You kids have no feel for dramatic tension. Then he cleared his throat and spoke in a powerful voice. I summon the power of Underpanty World! Suddenly, Captain Underpants rose triumphantly into the air. He was free at last! When the gigantic robots saw that Captain Underpants had escaped, the Herald 2000 launched its rocket arms at our hero. Captain Underpants grabbed the giant robo-arms and swung them around toward his foes. These might come in handy, said the waistband warrior. Chapter 25 The Incredibly Graphic Violence Chapter in Sound, Sound, Sound o -rama. O -rama. Trademark Warning! The following chapter contains scenes that are so violent and naughty, you aren't allowed to listen to them. We're not kidding. Do not listen to the following chapter. Don't even turn the volume down. Just skip ahead to chapter 26 and don't ask any questions. P.S. Don't breathe on it either. Hey, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be listening to this chapter. It's too violent and naughty. Now bend over and give yourself 11 spankings and a time out before proceeding. Maybe then you'll learn to follow instructions. <laughs> Roughing up the Robo George! <laughs> Horribly hurting the Herald 2000! Take that, evildoer! Let's put our heads together! The Super Smashy Cyber Slam! Smash! Boom! Gotcha! Silly robot! Tricks are for kids! Mechanical beam! Chapter 26, Reverse Psychology 2 The giant robots were defeated, but the battle was not over yet. Harold ran back to their treehouse to grab the 3D hypno ring, while George ran back to everything except fabric softener for some more supplies. Soon, George returned to the center of town carrying a big cardboard box filled with spray cans. What are you doing with that? asked Harold, who had just arrived with the 3D Hypno Ring. I'm taking this extra strength spray starch someplace where Wedgie Woman won't be able to find it, George shouted rather loudly. Extra strength spray starch? cried the wicked Wedgie Woman. That's just what I need. Her winding hair lashed out at George, stopping him dead in his tracks. Then nine twisting braids each grabbed a can from the box and began spraying them at Captain Underpants. A huge cloud of mist filled the air, covering everything in sight and making these two pages incredibly easy to draw. When the cloud finally lifted, all of Wedgie Woman's hair was gone. In fact, all of everybody's hair was gone. See, George explained, there was no spray starch in this box. This box was just a cleverly disguised carton of hair remover. I used reverse psychology on her. Ah! Screamed Harold as he clutched his bald head. 
My mom's going to lay hard-boiled eggs when she sees me. Relax, said George. Our hair will grow back. That's easy for you to say, said Harold. Your hair was only half an inch long. Chapter 27 Reverse, Reverse Psychology Well, wedgie woman, said Captain Underpants, it's off to jail with you. Wait a second, said Harold. We'll take care of Wedgie Woman. You go back to the school, put some clothes on, then wash your face. Yeah, bub, said George. Use plenty of water. We've got work to do. Okay, said Captain Underpants. So Captain Underpants did as he was told, and in no time at all, he was back to his cruppy old self. It was now time to transform Wedgie Woman back to her old self, too, with some slight modifications. Okay, said Harold. Remember when we hypnotized Miserable and she did the opposite of everything we wanted her to do? Yeah, said George. Well, if we want to set things right, Harold continued, we've got to hypnotize her into doing the opposite of the opposite of what we want. I'm way ahead of you, said George. So the two boys once again hypnotized their teacher. Only this time, they used reverse, reverse psychology on her. From now on, said George, you will always be known as Wedgie Woman. You will keep all your superpowers, too, said Harold. You will not go back to teaching fourth grade, said George. You will remember everything that happened in the last two weeks, said Harold. You will not change our grades back to normal, said George. You will not become the nicest teacher in the history of Jerome Horwitz Elementary School, said Harold. And you will not bake fresh chocolate chip cookies for our class every day, said George. George! said Harold sternly. Stop goofing around. I can't help it, said George. You should never hypnotize anybody when you're hungry. Okay, okay, said Harold. Let's just snap our fingers and pray that this works. Snap! Chapter 28 To make a long story short, it did. Chapter 29. Better Living Through Hypnosis The next day, Miserable entered the classroom looking a whole lot friendlier than usual. Boys and girls, said Miserable, I have some good news for you. Hooray! cried the children. It's time for English class, said Miserable. Moaned the children. Today, said Miserable, I've asked George and Harold to lead the class. Hooray! Cried the children. They're going to teach us about creative writing, said Miserable. Oh, man! Moaned the children. By showing us how to make our own comic books, said Miserable. Hooray! Cried the children. While they're doing that, said Miserable, I'm going to pass out something for you all to work on. Oh, man! Moaned the children. Homemade chocolate chip cookies, said Miserable. Hooray! Cried the children. This is awesome, said Harold. But do you think it was right for us to change her personality like we did? Sure, why not, said George. She's happier. She'll probably live longer. You're right, said Harold. I guess hypnosis is a pretty cool thing sometimes. Then again, as we all know, sometimes it isn't. Were these cookies hard to make? No, dear, they were a snack. Oh, no, screamed Harold. Here we go again, screamed George. Tra -la -la. Tra -la -la.
the end.